All right, thank you, everybody. Um, sorry about that. Had a short break. It was a little hard, but uh, we'll have an hour and a half of lunchtime. And uh, I'm told that the food people are off to Subway to get the sandwiches already, so we should be all set for that in about an hour. So I'd like to introduce Clint uh, KK7UQ. Right? Yes. Um, I actually met you the first time out of one of the Hamcast in Bainbridge, I think, or something. I was. I'm always remembering because I used to have a call sign. It's almost almost the same thing. Um, got a wonderful talk today about interfacing uh, the PC to the radios and the uh, wonderful movement to USB finally. So, without further ado. Are we turned on? <laughs> How's that? That's good. good. I'm Clint. BK7UQ, and before I start, I should give you a political <coughs> transparency disclaimer. I, I do have a financial interest in an interface company, which we'll be mentioning today, uh, and we'll also talk about several others as well. But if you detect bias, <coughs> that's just my grief. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, Start the pointer here in the 1990s and ignore the stuff that went on prior to that because really in the, in the 90s we started to see the, the transition to using the, the PC as one of the main elements in uh, amateur radio interfacing, primarily the sound card, but also serial ports and control ports uh, that are used to uh, do things like push to talk and that sort of thing. So the uh, the PC sound card was used. A serial port was used primarily for push to talk. Some people use it for CW. Some people might even use it for FSK. Uh, there were some people who actually used box from their transceiver as a push to talk mechanism. The other thing that uh, really happened during the 90s was an explosion in, uh, in free software uh, that was used by hands at that time. A typical machine was a cast on PC that was lying around the house and people, you know, if it ran Windows 98, it was, they were lucky at that time to do it. A lot of people ran DOS early on. So, <coughs> so where we are today in the uh, latter part of the first decade of the new century, I thought they'd say that. Um, we still have a variety of software sources uh, and even more. We have full featured interfaces that uh, provide a computer control with a CAT, uh, FSK, and CW, and uh, in addition to all the sound card modes, plus a lot of new modes that weren't around in the 90s. We also have PCs without serial ports, and the sound card uh, people, for some reason, want to use it for the real purpose, which is sending audio cues to you when you're typing on your keyboard. So it tends not to be used for ham radio or if you're using a more advanced computer. Well, I switched to USB from RX-232. Well, if you look at that description, I couldn't find the, sound, the uh, serial port in there anywhere. There are none on modern computers. Laptops in particular don't have a serial port anymore. So how are you going to do push to talk and all the things that we depend upon the serial port? <coughs> Well, one answer is the USB the serial port cable. And uh, I actually built up a system doing, using this actually to duplicate one of my designs. And it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> because if you make a mistake and plug the thing into the wrong cable, and all of a sudden you have to change the port assignments. And you turn the thing off, you plug it into a different USB port, it comes up with a different port assignment. It really is uh, annoying. But there's other reasons to, uh, to go into USB as well. For one thing, it's much simpler cabling. You don't have that uh, octopus to worry about. You have one cable that goes to the computer uh, from your interface, and you have a, an integrated cable that goes from your interface to your rig with the number of connectors on the other end depending upon the rig type that it is. Can you imagine having a system that you uh, gave to your, your uh, emergency group 
and told them to ruin the field and plug all this stuff in and never expect it to get right the first time. It's impossible. But by plugging in one USB cable, it makes them a lot simpler and more reliable. You really can't discount uh, the simplicity of that as a, as a major advantage. Uh, also, the other advantage is improved performance. <coughs> Some cards of the computers in the uh, late 90s were not great. Uh, even the, the Sound Blaster, which was a pretty good piece of equipment, but the ones that were built into the, the motherboards were noisy. If you had an 80 dB dynamic range, you were, you were lucky. That's not so true anymore. Uh, the laptop that I had here earlier has an excellent sound card with a good 100 dB dynamic range. Lower cost, uh, that's debatable. Um, by designing an integrated USB-based system, you can certainly beat the cost of individual components that you would buy, like a bunch of converters, an external sound card, and that sort of thing. But the, the overall cost uh, is probably about the same. <coughs> now, when you go to uh, design one of these things, and we're going to talk in some detail about the design of, of um, the navigator interface, which is this device here. As an example of what everybody has to go through who builds these things. Um, the most important thing is that we're compatible with the application software that's available. Uh, you'd also be able to like uh, to have multiple operating system support. Uh, oddly enough, there are people who like Macintoshes. And they have some pretty good software for that. Um, you need to support sound card applications. Uh, and you really want to have one that's dedicated to this task not sharing the one in the computer because it's, it's bad news to come up with the, the cord from Windows starting up and goes out over the air when you turn the computer on. <laughs> I don't care. Maybe it's good advertising. Those of you on PSK, uh, if you listen on 14.070, on, uh, upper sideband, every once in a while you're going to go, ta-da! <laughs> Is that what it is? Yeah. You'd like to also uh, support CW um, and uh, FSK RTTY. Uh, the the uh, AFSK RTTY has been around for some time on uh, PC applications, uh, but the people who are really serious about uh, RTTY contests, they really want to use the FSK to take advantage of the filters that are in their uh, transceiver. Plus, you want to have cat control uh, of your rig itself so you can consolidate everything at the PC screen. This is a list of uh, application support, uh, application software that is available today, uh, and there's others that I haven't even mentioned here. Somebody mentioned earlier that they stopped counting after 12. That's almost there. What are the most popular ones? They're on the screen. Digipan, the first one is mentioned. These are listed alphabetically. Like Dig Digipan is the one which is the um, most the easiest to use. <coughs> and it was the first one that really took advantage of um, modern PC uh, screen design, and it's still popular. It's a piece of free software that's <coughs> Russians. They also wrote uh, MixW later on, and they charged for that. Uh, the the really <coughs> popular one today, however, is uh, DM780, which is uh, a part of the uh, Ham Radio Deluxe suite, and it has just exploded in, in years. Uh, Simon Brown. Uh, he's done a wonderful job on that. From the uh, TTY world, the MMTTY is the mainstay of a lot of different applications that use the engine for that. For that.
and Hamskull uh, still maintains a lot of its popularity as well. Okay, the point here is that these software packages drive the design of the hardware uh, because you have to be compatible with them. And so the, the basic uh, port addressing model, which comes from all this different uh, software, is, uh, is this. Um, you need to have a dedicated channel for uh, cat control. And it typically needs to run up to uh, 150 kilobyte, although most applications run 9600 or 19.2. Uh, you need to have a separate port with assignments for the two control bits for push to talk and CW. And that's usually uh, the request to send line, RTS, and data terminal radio line, DTR. The data channel on that one is uh, a third channel is a uh, third port is uh, for CW. In this case, I've shown Win Key as an example of that. For people who are really serious about CW, they like, they like to have a, a high end controlling element for CW where you can set all the different parameters. And the, uh, the Win Key 2 by K1EL uh, is a really popular one. And it requires a serial port. And then finally, uh, you need a separate. Yes, he does the USB version of this as well. Yeah. Yes, he does. The one key two dash USB <coughs> is that, and it, it supports actually two transceivers. You can have stuff for both. It's also built into that interface. Uh, FSK uh, RTTY uh, is, a, is a separate. Uh, port required as well, and then you really would like it to run in a true 45.455, which, as far as I can tell, none of these devices will run at. It's a problem. So you need to solve that problem. A couple of additional requirements for ports are uh, an auxiliary RS-232 for people who still have stuff there that they want to use like their antenna motor controllers uh, or packet radio. If they don't have a dedicated uh, uh, data channel that they can, they can go to a packet system for picking up DX plotting and stuff like that. And then finally, um, if you can configure the interface internally, uh, it, that requires a port as well. So we're looking at five ports here, six. Okay, the cat port uh, is a serial data port. Uh, it typically runs in the 9600, 19.2 uh, baud range. Some will run up at very high baud rates, uh, but generally they're in the middle ground. Uh, this is usually a, a typical data port without additional controls. There are a couple of cases where you really like to have um, RTS, CTS, handshake, and on. Uh, but by and large, it's the data path. Now, there's some subsets of this for the different transceivers. The uh, ICOM CIV is a half duplex two wire system. It's also, in some cases, used by a certain ASU uh, devices as well. Uh, the RS232. Levels uh, are used for uh, Elcraft, Kenwood, Tentec, and Yesu. There is a, a group of Kenwood and Yesu transceivers that use TTL level, and then the, there's another oddball by Kenwood that uses an inverted TTL. So you have to be able to, to meet all these needs. Uh, some of the applications, unfortunately, are limited to uh, addressing the COM1 through COM8 level. And I'm talking about six channels here. Um, which means that you may have to reassign some ports if you have other conflicting devices that are already using ports in that range. This comes about uh, from uh, a <coughs> version of, of software that we used that did not have a addressing range beyond the channel 8. Uh, the modern stuff that's coming out today 
will allow you to use the full 255 device uh, address. Uh, address. Okay. There's a couple of different uh, architectures that are used to uh, incorporate USB into the interface. And what I've shown here is one which uh, is actually built and manufactured by the fellows who wrote NextW. This is called the Rig Expert. It's two sides of a small board. It, had, it requires a single USB connection, uh, and the, that single channel is then passed on to the application MixW, so it only takes up one port address. And that's, it's a really neat design. Uh, they've got uh, A to B converters on here, and a CPU, and a high-speed buffer, uh, bidirectional channel built into it. It's no longer in production. Uh, <laughs> BCA is why they stopped doing this. They brought out a more advanced unit a few years later, but I think this is a really delicate piece of part of it. The problem is that it depends upon the manufacturer and uh, doing both the hardware and the application at the same time. Since they both mix W and they charge money for it, they can afford to enhance it and do all the work in that application that keeps it down to a single channel. They discovered, however, that people wanted to run other software, excuse me, wanted to run other software the next time. Can you still hear me? Can I get that? Yep. Um, and so they added a piece of software, the router level, that basically takes that single channel and creates virtual ports that look like a bunch of independent <coughs> ports that can be addressed and assigned to uh, different tasks so that uh, programs like MMTTY and DigiPan and some of the others could use this as well. With the same piece of hardware, they brought out that layer of software to do the same thing. Still a good design. And then there's the other approach. Uh, I come from the hardware design world, so if there's a hardware way to do it, you choose that over software by definition. <laughs> right. This uh, device here is such a device. It has an integrated hub. It has dual channel UARTs. It has a, a sound system. It has an audio monitor. All kinds of things which justify it being four times the size of the one on the, on the side here. The good news is that the, uh, all these devices come with drivers that are already and running and, and controlled by somebody else, in this case, by either Microsoft or other people in Linux or Mac world. And so it's possible to use the building block elements and build a pretty straightforward design. When it came time to decide if we're going to go ahead with this project and build this, we looked at these two models, and from our standpoint, there was really only one choice. Time to market was faster using the hardware model. The ongoing support costs for maintaining uh, your own drivers is fairly expensive. It's not my design strength. Uh, and so all the, the checks on the right hand side uh, really would lead us to, uh, to that particular approach. The one on the left, however, um, the manufacturing cost is the one trade off that we chose to make to accept something that is more expensive to manufacture, the flexibility and, uh, and control. So that's what this looks like. <coughs> we chose this case size intentionally so you can stack it, like on 706 on top of it, or 7000, or any of the small transceivers. Um, it's 
the desk space um, sometimes is at a premium, and so you can stack your tuner in the interface and your transceiver and something as high as an advantage. Plus, one of the markets that we had for this product is in uh, MCOMs. Uh, we have a bunch of people on the East Coast that use this throughout their emergency communications groups. And they really wanted the rugged device as well. So, the requirements uh, for this were we want a single USB connection, um, which meant you know, we needed a four channel hub to be able to get all the ports we wanted. We wanted to be able to sequence the power uh, off the USB uh, at the hub control level so that when it started up, it drew small amounts of current until it was registered on the system. And to keep the bar requirements as low as possible, consistent with what we're doing. And this is typically about a 160 mil draw on the device, which for a four channel hub is way under the spec. And no additional power supplies were also a requirement. No wall boards. You should have a sign that had lines through the wall boards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from an audio standpoint, um, we decided to save on 16 bit stereo because there are building blocks available for it that were already USB devices for drivers. They use the standard AC97 drivers. We chose the TI Fur Brown PCM2904 or 2906, which actually is the one you'll see in all the products that are on the market today. Same part is used in at least three that I know of. We needed to transform or isolate the audio into the output. And uh, oh, on the audio output, one channel is used to drive the transceiver. The other channel is used to go to an audio monitor so you can hear what you're sending out from a sound standpoint. I really like that feature. I have people look at me like stairs Turn the knob off. That's the easy way out. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, two input channels because there are transceivers that have a main and a sub receiver, and you want to be able to see both of them on the screen at the same time. Uh, and I'm from the, I guess I'm one of the guys who've been around too long. But I like knobs, I like them. So this has five potentiometers on it for control of the audio input for both channels, for audio output, uh, the volume control for the monitor, and the gain speed for the K1 and the K2. Audio, um, we, our design goal was to be able to run from 100 hertz to uh, over five kilohertz consistent with the sampling rate of that you select. And that's pretty well handled in the driver itself um, as far as the, the audio part is concerned. There are applications that will run over 2,000 uh, hertz wide signals and they need to be able to have a reasonably flat response over that. And there's going to be some people that come out with something that more than that, I'm sure. Now from an operating mode standpoint, uh, we need to handle all popular sound card modes. And the good news is that the general purpose um, sound device uh, is pretty well fit in that category. RTTY was considered to be yeah, important um, using true uh, FSK mode um, with 45.45 watts, so we built our own chip inside the inside. general purpose chip that uh, is used for other things as well, but it does take a five bit code, uh, auto code, and convert it into a standard FSK at the right bottom there. And finally, uh, we want to CW using uh, K1EL from here too. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that the Win Tier 2 it is available in a package which is uh, USB based. And it's set up to handle two different transceivers and kind of wired up at the same time and just select which one you use. 
We only implement one channel. <coughs> Speed control by a front panel pot. You can also use sliders in the software to adjust the rate as well. And it supports a, trans a transceiver with a linear amplifier. So it does generate a separate push to top control that's steered to the, to the linear amp to turn it on just before the key down and leave it on after the last keystroke. And that's an off device later. One as well. Okay, uh, hardware push to top control. Um, I mentioned earlier that some people have used Vox in the early years. Vox is not a very reliable method if it's using your transceiver. And the reason is that to get it to trigger reliably, you have to raise the audio drive level to the point that you start uh, getting clipping in your audio channel. Uh, so your IMD goes up. There's a device, however, the Signal Link products build their own box into the interface, and that's a very reliable method. Um, the audio monitor that's built into it um, can monitor the, the audio channel for all sound card modes. It also generates the FSK light tone so you can hear what it sounds like FSK keying, even though you're actually doing closure out this point to the rig. Uh, and the CW also has a path for listening to the keystrokes. You can also turn that off if you use monitoring from the rig for either FSK or for CW. And the CAT uh, supports all proper transceivers. So you know, yeah. Okay. Um, we did decide to add a... That should be RS-232. Somebody played the proposal. <laughs> Our different port um, was provided for those people who have uh, equipment that requires a, a true serial port. Uh, and I know people who use it for for packet controllers or for our antenna rotator. The uh, other feature that we felt was important was that we shouldn't have to take the cover off the unit to change jumpers, especially people who use the same device with different transceivers, but if there's any um, variations that need to be set, you either do them by software or you put it in the cable so we can change the cable to automatically. And so we actually do screws. You can't find a screwdriver for them. Take the <laughs> Okay, uh, here's a block diagram. Of, uh, of this a device that uses the uh, HUD controller approach. Um, the HUD controller is four channels, and yet we get six ports in an audio out of it. And the way we do that is by using a part from FPDI, a dual USB UART. So there's two UART channels per physical port connection. So there's, okay, there's we, there are six ports available for control and data. And then the, the last one is um, tied into the USB uh, audio codec itself. The uh, audio path is, is uh, transformer isolated, which is important for keeping noise off of your receive channel more than anything else. It also certainly helps when you're transmitting because there's a lot of RF floating around. But our main goal is to maintain it that there's no additional noise added or at least minimized uh, into the audio path. That control uh, is generalized and adapted in the uh, interface connector itself. Push to talk uh, and CW are on a separate channel. Uh, there are two approaches for CW. One is using an intelligent controller like the uh, K1EL wind gear, and the other one is let software uh, move a control line up and down for the same purpose. And some software only supports one or the other, and some provide both mechanisms there. 
We also uh, provided an input uh, on the DC line. In fact, several lines now that can be used by Apple Link to know that uh, squelch has been broken on the array. So there's an input there as well. The wind key controller uh, I mentioned earlier it has a pod on it, which is used for uh, speed control. And there's usually a display, and there is a display in the software that shows you what you're setting. Oh, uh, one additional item here: uh, we also brought out a separate CID connector. A lot of people need their transceiver or one other device to have a CID connection, and they don't want to pay the extra money from ICOM. Sorry, folks. So we provided some uh, standard cable there and get uh, two CID channels out. <coughs> provided, of course, that it's run by the same operator as software. Uh, the building blocks that we use for the hub controller is an Atmel 43301, which is a very nice little part. Uh, it has both the four port hub and it has all the stuff built in for the power sequence and control. And we use the Micro uh, 2025 power control chip to uh, switch downstream voltage on after the hub has been uh, set up properly. Uh, port devices are FTDI, the FT2232. Uh, that has two COM ports per hub channel. It can either be a UART or a high speed parallel buffer. And we actually use both of those for that. Uh, and it has the drivers available for XP, Vista, Linux, and Macintosh. And the audio part is the CIPCM2904. Or the 2906. 2906 also gives get you um, optical connections, which we don't use, but the part we use. The school supports have been raised up to 48,000. As a matter of fact, the standard setup for EM780 is to set the sample rate to 48,000. The other building blocks that we use are two PIC devices. The the 16F688 is the wind feed controller, and I buy that from Steve, A1EL, pre programmed. And uh, uh, we use the 16F870 for the FSD controller <coughs> and the configuration. So that's what the, the board looks like. You can see it's physically this size here. Yeah. And it, it led to a straightforward layout where functions are actually within little bounded areas, and just so I can remember what they are on the test. Yeah? You did a demonstration once about comparing a sound card in your computer and you can see the interference and noise background. And that was just uh, the. What you saw was the prototype uh, audio thing that I brought up when you were shown there. What, what was it one of these? Well, I thought it was this. Okay, and then it was this. Okay. Well, okay. so I guess it was the guys in Canada that I went to the year before. Okay. Um, you will notice if you look on a monitor that has a spectrum display, like Mixed W does, um, that when you turn this on, the line is pretty much flat, minus 100 dB. You'll see the little tiny tips down through there that are probably in. One to two dB level. It's really quiet. You can put the thing inside the computer unless there's really special design taken care of. Which in the earlier PCs they didn't do. You're going to have noise levels that are not even ten to twenty dB level. Still get a lot of dynamic. You're really looking for. But um, all the ones I've seen that use external um, out of the computer interfaces, including the commercial. Uh, USB sound card devices, <coughs> all those competitors' products, they're all pretty quiet. Okay, challenges. Uh, single 5 volt power source. This comes from the USB. 
it's noisy. Uh, it limits the audio output to a one and a half volt uh, RMS max because of its limit. Uh, if you've got this actually generous, you don't need anywhere near that to go out and transceive it. Um, when you shut down a PC, they do strange things on the USB bus. Some of them turn the power off, some of them leave the power on, some of them power it down. It's <laughs> I get to answer a lot of questions on a reflector. And that there was a whole series of stuff going on about that. Uh, and it depends on the computer. Is what they do. Um, another important challenge is SEC Part 15. Uh, our device is certified under Part 15, as any USB device should be qualified under Part 15. Uh, for a small company with a limited market, it's a big part of your, your expense, but it's, it's worth it. And one of the side benefits is that when you go through to be sure it meets Part 15, you start tracking down other kinds of noise too, but that nice instrument you've got in your shack, your transceiver, uh, will show you is there. Uh, and in fact, USB radiated noise is, a, is another challenge. We've gotten so we ship a cable like this with ferrites on both ends with every unit we ship. And it's amazing how this cleaned everything up. Um, I've just been recently going through another what we call glitch hunts. I had a customer report that he saw a signal at, at 14.044 when the uh, cat started. And so, where is that coming from? Is it coming from the serial port that goes off to the rig and stuff like that? Well, it turns out to be it was SEC, it was a USB box. Um, and I did some testing about the ferrites. Sure enough, there it was. About the same frequency as he was seeing, there was actually a tone there and then hashed to here. Now, this is down at the sub S1 level. So you only hear it on a really quiet band, it's still there. And guys who are open DX sometimes like to have no additional noise added. The ferrites really help, but I found also that if you have other USB devices that aren't even tied to this, but that program is running and I'm doing a lot of pulling loops on the UARTs for a cat, you see the noise on the other cables as well. So I advise him to switch over this kind of cable for all of his USB devices. He was happy to do it because it solved his problem. The uh, COM1 and COM8 just have to live with. This does complicate the, the configuration because when you plug in your device, uh, Windows may assign you COM ports 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever. You may have to move some stuff around to get your stuff to fit the application of the PS. Okay. Here are uh, typical control cables that are used. Um, the complex, this is an ICOM 706 and 7000, 703, and that's really, that's well, not this one. This is for the 706 with the pin 13, but if you just replace this with the, uh, the 6 pin again, it's used, uh, it will do the same. I, I put this up here to show that you really have to pay attention to all of this stuff. We use shield, and a lot of competitors do too. Uh, everybody who's successful in this business has to shield these cables. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'd love to have a group shield over a bunch of individually shielded ones as well. Uh, and that's just to keep your RF out of this thing, and uh, or whatever. It's just good kind of practice. The Elcraft K3, Simon Brown, um, recently did some work to uh, add our wind key controller and some other devices in the 780. He took control, took the delivery of the K3 about the same time. And I, I don't know if you, he's really falling in love with this rig. He's, he's convinced me. So I'll be interested to see the, the next talk and you see a K3 in action. Actually look down there, it's that one small little rig, what's the K3? It's a beautiful little rig. Look at the 
that you can see that if it runs FSK mode on the norm, it doesn't see that the mode directly, it doesn't get something on the way of the signal line. Actually making coffee, although it probably won't be ready for another 15, 20 minutes. It's on now. So, good news tempered with some not so good news. Um, also, lunch is ready. Um, lunch is being served kind of buffet style outside um, to the right. There's a little kitchen that um, has subway sandwiches and the pops and the snacks and everything. The idea is to, to go grab yourself some food and then come back into here. Um, Please, there are coolers there with pop in them that are actually Microsoft's on ours, so please don't grab pop out of coolers. There's plenty of pop at the end of the table though. So um, there's more than enough food, so it looks like I overbought again, although I can't seem to figure out how to stop doing that. Um, other than that, we'll get started about 1.30, and um, thank you everybody, we'll see you back soon.